regular people are taking their knowledge and content, packaging it up in an online course, and they're making a living doing it. But not everyone is successful with online courses. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And I'm here to help course creators actually succeed with online courses. Hi, I'm Jacques Hopkins, and this is The Online Course Show. Hey out there, and welcome back to The Online Course Show. I'm your host, Jacques Hopkins, and newsflash, I absolutely love online courses, and here we are with episode 199 of The Online Course Show. If you're new here, welcome. We talk about all things online courses here. Oftentimes, we'll have guests who have their own courses, or we'll bring in experts in certain areas. And that's exactly what we have today is we have an expert in offers and funnels and just really increasing and maximizing your sales for your online course business. And who doesn't want that, right? Like I said, this is episode 199. I teased it a little bit last week and I'll do it again here today because we have a nice round number coming up in the next episode. Next episode is episode 200. And for 200, I have a very, very special guest coming on. And I decided I'm going to reveal to you at the end of this episode who that special guest is. This is somebody that I've wanted to have on the podcast for years and years and years. One of the top two or three most influential people on me personally is a very, very big name. Most of you probably know who this is. I will reveal it to you at the end. I've already recorded the the interview with that person for the next episode. It's going to be a great one. Really looking forward to that. So stay tuned to the end and I'll let you know all about episode 200, the very next episode. But this here is episode 199. Okay, let's talk about a successful online course business. Okay, after my years of running my own online course and talking to so many successful course creators on this podcast and working with so many course creators, I've developed what I call the online course business formula. And what I've found is that the successful, you know, six, seven figure, even eight figure online course businesses have certain components and those components interact with each other in a certain way. And each component looks a certain way uh, for those successful ones. Okay. Those core components are, we have traffic, we have some sort of sales funnel. We have an offer that we're putting in front of people that they can say yes or no to. And then we have our actual product our course or membership. We also have transformation based testimonials. And if you're listening on audio only, then I'm not going to be able to really convey to you the, 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 the arrows of my diagram and how they all interact with each other. But I promise there's a very strategic way that they do interact with each other. But those are the core components that you really need and and to do them in the right way to have a successful online course business. And that's the key of what we talk about around here is how to have a successful online course business, not simply how to have a successful online course, right? You can make the world's greatest online course, but if you don't have the other components down, it's not going to be profitable. You're not going to make money from it. And therefore you're not going to have a business. A business has traffic, it has marketing, it it has sales, right? It has the funnel and it has the offer and so on. It's not just an online course. I want to help you make an online course business. And I have a training around all of this. I have about a 40 minute free training where I'm going to walk you through each of these components. I'm going to walk you through the formula, how they interact with each other, what order you should do them in. And if you're, if you're just starting out and then maybe you're not starting out and you want to dial in each of your components, that's all in this 40 minute training. You can find that free workshop by going to the online course guy.com and clicking on free workshop at the top. It's not going to waste your time. There's no fluff. We get right into it. There's not even a hard sales pitch at the end, trying to give you as much value as possible there. Now, as far as that online course business formula goes, my guest today is going to talk primarily about some of the middle components, the funnel and the offer, because that is what he is an expert in. My guest today, his name is John Ainsworth, and he runs an agency where he helps course creators two to five X their existing revenue. So he only works with people that already have an online course business, right? They're already generating traffic. They already have a course, but he helps people two to five X their revenue 
with their existing traffic, with their existing course. And it's a very much like done for you, done with you type of service. And so much so that he doesn't actually charge his clients unless they get results. So he takes a percentage of their results. If he doesn't get you any results, then he doesn't make any money from you. But as you can imagine, he can only accept people that he is absolutely certain he is going to be able to help. So he only accepts 11% of the people that actually apply to work with him and his team. But what's really interesting about John is he is an expert at these tripwire funnels, okay? He's he's not the he's not a webinar funnel guy. I'm a big fan of webinar funnels, and the reason is is because so many of the success stories that I have coming on this podcast and I see around, their main sales mechanism is is a webinar. But John has found success with these tripwire funnels where you have like a low, low ticket offer, and then you've got you've got uh, order bumps and you've got upsells. And so he talks a lot about that in this episode and how to execute that, some of the success stories he's seen. And so that's typically the type of funnel that he will implement for his clients. And the reason is, is because he finds that not that the webinar funnels are not effective, it's just that putting together an effective webinar funnel is challenging and maybe not for everybody and that these tripwire funnels are easier and a lower barrier to to actually get results and get results quicker. So if that type of funnel sounds good to you, then stay tuned to this episode. John's going to share with us his best tips and tricks on that. He's going to talk all about how to effectively use order bumps and upsells to increase the average cart, like the average price that somebody's paying you per transaction. And you can find out a lot more by visiting John's website. And maybe you're one of those that would like to apply to work with him. You can find more information about him and his agency by going to datadrivenmarketing.co. And before we get into that full conversation, this episode is brought to you by Kajabi, my now all-time favorite online course platform, tech platform, if you will. We run the entire OCG brand inside of Kajabi. And look, this is this is the main benefit is, is having everything under one roof has been just such a game changer in terms of my mental clarity and capacity and ability to run an online course business. And so we've had the OCG uh, the OCG brand under Kajabi now for over a year now, and it's been such a success that we are now moving over my piano course, my online, my main online course business that I've had for over 10 years now, Piano in 21 Days. We're moving that over to Kajabi now, and we have now moved over all the courses and all the order forms, and all of our new sales are now coming into that in Kajabi. It's going really well so far. The next step is to migrate our old students, and then we're probably going to move all the other components of that business into Kajabi as well because having everything under one roof in a place that you can really trust and does things really well is amazing is really, really amazing. In fact, I got an Instagram DM from a guy named Matt just a couple of days ago. He said, hi, Jacques, I hope you're well. I have come across your podcast and I'm going from the start. I'm looking to build a course, but I'm getting a little lost in the amount of options for builders. Can you recommend a platform to build my course or would you suggest WordPress or something? Thank you. Well, that's actually where my piano business has been is WordPress and it has mostly been a lot of headaches. And so I would highly recommend to Matt, you know, starters like Matt, don't think anything else of it. Just go with Kajabi and you will thank me later. I have lots of people in my coaching program that are on all these different platforms. They're using, you know, Teachable for their courses. They're using something else for emails. They're using something else for landing pages. And, and just they're using all these different pieces of software. And they could just wrap that all up and be using Kajabi instead. And some of them have actually made the switch to Kajabi and are super, super thankful and are really happy with that decision. So it's a place that you can run, not just an online course, you can do that. But I was talking about the online course business earlier. You can run your whole online course business in Kajabi. And let's take the, the tech part, uh, let's take that headache out and let's focus on the things that really matter, which is making great courses, making sales for those, and impacting others, and Kajabi allows you to do that. I've got a great offer for you. If that sounds good to you, you can head to everyclickkajabi.com, and there you can take advantage of this offer where you'll get a double free trial of Kajabi. If you just go to their website, you'll just get like a 14-day free trial. If you use this link I'm telling you about, you'll get a 30-day free trial of Kajabi. You'll also get 
my full course showing you every single mouse click, every single keyboard keystroke that I made when setting up my entire online course business in Kajabi. I recorded that whole process so that if you're looking to build an online course business in Kajabi, you can just follow along, follow the steps, every single click, every keystroke as well. No steps left out. You'll get that course free if you use my link everyclickkajabi.com. You'll get that longer trial plus my free course on exactly how to set things up. Once again, everyclickkajabi.com. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into that full conversation with John Ainsworth from datadrivenmarketing.co. Hey, John, welcome to the online course show. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Let's uh, let's start pretty basic. like. T tell the audience uh, what you do. Who, who do you help? We partner with online course creators and we help them somewhere between about two and five times their revenue through email marketing and funnels mostly. Um, we do it on a payment on results basis. If they don't make more money, they don't pay us anything. Um, we work with people who've got from a few thousand visitors a month up to, you know, got a client like 9 million YouTube subscribers. Payment on results, you know, that makes me think of uh, Homozi, right? Put together an offer so good, people feel stupid saying no to it, right? I, I would imagine with a with a kind of a guarantee like that, you gotta be pretty selective about who you work with, is that fair to say? Yeah, we take on about 11% of people who apply to work with us. So we've got like a form on our website, it's the first step, um, people go fill it out, and it asks a bunch of questions. If we think they look like they could be a good fit, then they get through to the next stage where we have a 15 minute call, where we check more, could they be a good fit? If they get through that, they get to the next stage where we uh, have like a 45 minute call and we ask them a bunch more questions and like really check if they're a good fit. If they get through that, then we do an audit, a full audit with them. And at that stage, like, okay, cool. Yes, definitely you're, you're now in, you know? So we, we have to be pretty picky because, but I didn't really like it any other way. Like I don't want to work with anybody where I'm not sure I can make them. I don't want someone paying me money and then not making money from it. So, uh, you know, it kind of works for us. Yeah, that I agree with you. But what I mean, the eighty nine percent that you're rejecting, like it sounds like they still want help. Like they have goals that they're trying, they're trying to reach. Like, what is the difference between the eighty nine percent you're saying no to and the eleven percent you're saying yes to? So the model that we use is we start working with people who've already got a source of traffic, they've already got an email list, and they've already got product market fit, and those are not easy things to get started with. So we uh, have kind of certain minimum requirements on all of those, all of those three, like they have to have a certain level of, you know, proof that people are really enjoying their courses, they really like them, that they're buying them, even though their funnels maybe aren't great at the moment. Um, what we have for the others is we do offer people they can buy just our course if they want to. And so like we've got a group coaching program, like a done with you and a done for you service where we help clients. But if somebody as part of the coaching program, we built a whole course out. And if they want to just buy the course, they can get that at that stage. And we've had someone recently, actually, who a while ago bought the course and then it's like implemented enough that she now qualifies and just come back to work with us. And sometimes we point them off to other people because, you know, other people have different models where they can help someone who's just getting started. We don't work with people who are just getting started. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Like we had uh, we had Bryce Gump on the podcast and he's he is a paid ads guy and he you know, we were talking about funnels a little bit and he's like, you know. I don't really help people with funnels a lot, but you know who does is John. <laughs> John helps people with funnels. And so that's really great that you've, you know, you stay in your lane. That's, that can be really hard to do for people. So just to make sure I understood it correctly, I'm trying to kind of take notes and follow along, but the big three things you mentioned that for the people that you do want to work with on this really close level would be, they already have product market fit. They already have an email list and they already have an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about what about the size of the? I mean, does it matter what size the email list and audience are? Yeah, the minimum of ten thousand for the email list, um, and then an audience where when we plug it into our spreadsheets, it shows that we could help them to make a bunch more money. Like most people who've got website traffic aren't getting enough of those people onto their email list, so we know what percentage we can get them to. And if we put it into our spreadsheets, and it's going to say, yeah, yeah, we can get these guys to a much higher level, we can make them a bunch more money. They're going to be happy. We're going to be happy. Everyone's a winner. So it depends because audience, it depends, right? Because YouTube channels convert differently to website traffic, converts differently to Instagram. So I can't say like a specific number on that, but with the email list, it's 10,000. What do you, what do you, um, 
for, for people that don't have those things, like they, maybe they have an audience and an email list, but they don't have product market fit. What do you tell, what do you tell those people? Yeah. So we do with someone who hasn't got product market fit, we'll do an initial session with them, but they can't then work with us long-term until they've got that part figured. So we'll do an initial session where we help them figure out, right, these are the steps you need to go through to prove product market fit. And we, we aren't the people to do it, but we can show you what the process is. So for example, you're going to need to survey your audience, check what, what topics people are really interested in. You're going to maybe you want to do a pre-sell to them to make sure, okay, is that definitely something that's worth doing? Then you'll want to make sure you make an amazing course. If you want help with that, here's a contact of ours who is a um, an expert at putting course um courses together in terms of like making sure you've got the right topics covered you've got the right support materials it covers different learning styles that kind of thing if you want to work with them otherwise here's a podcast i did with them where you can kind of go through and get the basic idea like all the kind of steps to go through and then if you do that and you have that course made and there's definite interest in it then you can come back and work with us and we'll we'll help you to crush it in terms of selling a lot of them so there's there would be a fair amount of people listening to this that that do you know fit fit those criteria email list for the list, at least ten thousand people a budding you know YouTube channel or TikTok or whatever and product market fit you know they're they're just they're looking to scale right they're they're making five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars a month but they feel like they could be making thirty forty fifty a hundred whatever is there so it sounds like that's the you know the eleven percent that you end up working with is there a common thread or common threads among that group of people? Uh, in terms of what their problems are, I, I imagine with how dialed in you have this thing, you you can um, you've got it isolated to like okay, you come in, you fulfilled this, okay, now we need to go ahead and optimize these core areas to get maximized results. Yeah, there's three main areas that people have gaps here. Is it everything in threes? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember things in threes. <laughs> <laughs> so. One is um, increase the revenue. Most people have got a low revenue per sale. So most people average order value is, is way too low. Second thing is most people, they have too small of a percentage of their email list who are actually buying from them. And the third one is most people have too few email subscribers compared to their audience size. So what we're trying to do is increase the revenue per sale, increase the percentage of email subscribers who are buying each month and increase the number of email subscribers. That's the three big topics. Do you want me to dive in with those into kind of how we do it? Yeah, if you don't mind. I mean, should we start with revenue per sale? Yeah, and that's the easiest one. That's actually the one we recommend most people start with. So there's two main ways to do it. There's order bumps and there's upsells. And most people are just missing these completely. Or if they've got something, then they're not optimized at all. So um, I know you know this, but an order bump is on someone's checkout page, they have a tick box where there's an additional product that, that they can buy. You've got like two, three, four, maybe five sentences explaining what it is. It tends to be, you'd normally do it about a third of the price of the original product that someone's buying. And between, if you set it up properly, then between about 30 and 60% of people will buy it. So it adds on average about 20% to your, to your revenue. And that can be done quite quickly like you can get some the first version in place you can just take an exit go through existing products you've got find what you've got that might be a good fit add it in and then from then on you make maybe like a bit less than 10 percent extra revenue and you can do that in a couple of days if you've got let's say seven courses you could go through and do that in a couple of days let's i i do in general love order bumps um i have mixed feelings on upsells and i want to talk about that a little bit but as far as the order bumps go um, one common objection I see is like, where do you draw the line between including something as an order bump versus just as a bonus with the offer? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting one. I mean, generally what we do is we take stuff that isn't, that is already a separate product that's already sold separately and isn't part of the course at the moment. And then go, would that fit with this? And what the things we're looking at here is something that goes really nicely with what they're selling, but isn't required. And the bonuses, I know there's crossover there, right? The bonuses could mm -hmm. be something else that's going to help you with the same kind of idea. So it could be um, additional workbooks. It could be additional um, uh, like Q&A session that goes you know, through. So the, the highest ever performing order bump that I've ever seen, somebody was selling a course about how to run your marketing agency. And the order bump was 
interviews with eight marketing agency owners about the biggest make mistake they made when they were scaling their um, agency. Mm. And so you could include that as a bonus. You absolutely could. But at some point, you know, you decide, okay, well, what else, what things uh, could I, could I offer for additional money here? Um, I think they're great. I mean, I think it's just like, take something that you're already comfortable that there's a separate product. Look what you've got. That's the best thing at the moment that might be a good fit and, and add that in. I don't think the idea is take something out. That's currently a bonus. You can, you totally could do, but I normally do it with a separate product. And also one of the things that works really nicely here is to um, just start with something like don't try and make the perfect product, just get something in there to get going. Most people want to optimize everything and make it the perfect order bump, but I like just start with something you've already got. With Piano in 21 days, we've basically, we've got two, two main offers, uh, the, the bottom level and, and the, 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 the promised outcome is essentially the same, like learn piano quickly. Uh, but, but the bottom tiered offer, the lower priced offer is basically my video course. And then the, the higher tier is the video course. And then like every possible bonus I could throw in there. Like we have additional courses, we have some interaction, we have a community, we have all kinds of stuff. Okay. So with the, with the bottom tier, the order bump is one of the, the bonus courses from the top tier. That's easy, right? That's super easy. It's effective. It works. But with the, because of the my business model and the way I've structured it, it's just like, hey, the top tier is just like everything that I have. I've always struggled with what the order bump could be for that. Any suggestions on how I would go about crafting up an order bump for that top tier product that I offer? Interesting. Okay. If it's all right, what I will do, I'll, I'll try and answer it now, but what I'll do is I'm going to get my team. What we do sometimes for people is actually like go through, come up with order bumps for them and mock them up like on a, on a checkout page. So I'm going to get my team to go through and, and have a go at this for you. Um, but off the top of my head, let's see. So the current situation is you've got everything that you could possibly think of already <laughs> added in as a bonus. Yeah. And look, that's, that's, I, I'm, I'm all about simplicity. So that's like, I, I give, like, I like saying, okay, what's the dream outcome? Learn piano very, very fast. And then like, okay, certainly there's other objections to that, that people might have, and let's create bonuses around those objections. And then as a simple business model, we give people two options when they sign up, you can just get the course or you get the course and every other bonus I've ever concocted up. What about then considering your kind of philosophy on it, something that you couldn't include at no extra cost. So something that would have to have a cost with it, like some personal coaching mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. something from a, maybe not something that you're offering. Cause I know you've got that whole funnel, like so automated, but like if you had a partner who was doing lessons over Skype or something like that, so you're like, I could add that in as well, but you definitely can't have that just as a free bonus. Would it fit? Why not? Because <laughs> I do. <laughs> so, so look, my my upper tier is uh, within the funnel. There's a two hundred dollar discount down to seven ninety seven. So regular price is nine ninety seven. And one of the one of the uh, items in the in the in the stack is two one on one private lessons. And I have offered that John for at least five years. And you know how many times I've done a one-on-one -on -one lesson with a, somebody that bought my piano course? Like, like four. Okay. <laughs> and I've sold thousands and thousands of copies of this. I, I, for whatever reason, people do not, you know, take advantage of it. Um, it's very interesting. And so the one order bump that I have tried is basically what you're talking about is, Hey, do you want three additional one-on-one -on -one sessions, you know, for another, you know, one, uh, 197 or something like that. And of, you know, I don't have that active right now, but I did try it for a while and some people would take advantage of it, but nobody ever, you know, th then they, then they had five sessions and, and they don't even take the first one. So I felt bad, like selling something to people that they literally never use. Interesting. Okay. But on the other hand, it's free money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a friend who was doing, um, guitar lessons. And he would always sell at like Christmas time or whatever else. Why not buy some for somebody else? And he said that was always his most profitable ones because people never come and actually use all of the sessions that they've been bought mm. as a gift, you know. Yes. But 
does feel a little bit weird selling someone something you know they're not going to actually use so yeah i don't know that's i guess i was more I, I, I was for you but yeah. i was more not trying to discredit what you're saying i was more trying to validate what you're saying like yeah look i was on the same page with you like maybe add a couple of one-on-one -on -one sessions even though i'm already including a couple like let's add even more and um people definitely took advantage of it um it, not super often, but sometimes I'd see this weird transaction number come through. Like, you know, somebody bought for like $960. I'm like, oh, they took advantage of that order bump, you know, that that nobody ever cashes in on. Um, but that is interesting. Like, basically what I'm hearing is if somebody's already, you know, got a pretty good business in place, they're selling courses, but they don't have an order bump uh, on their offers, that could be like the top top spot to look at, at possibly increasing your revenue by 10, 20, 30%, just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're typically seeing. Like we track this on every single project. I've got the spreadsheet here. Let me pull it up. Order bump revenue. We've got one client where they've made $104,000 in the last year from just from order bumps. And the average increase in revenue is just under 20%, like 18%. Wow. All right. So one of the reasons I like order bumps so much, especially compared to upsells, is that it doesn't feel like we're like tricking people. There's no bait and switch. Like it's it's right there in front of them before they hit checkout. Like if you wanted to have this little adder, great. Um, I have mixed feelings about upsells, right? Tell me your thoughts on upsells because it feels like once we, for me, like once we hit checkout, like then give them the stuff. Don't try to sell them again. Okay. Let me... Let me try and put it a different way for you then. Let's imagine you're in a business where you've got seven courses. Let's say you're selling English language courses, right? You've got like A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Someone buys your, your intermediate, your B1 course. Then for me, like a perfect order bump at that point is something like getting hold of our PDF fault, like get hold of every PDF that I've ever made around... Uh, around this topic. And so it's like an additional thing. It's outside the course, but it's like an additional useful resource. The upsell is then the next course. You've just sold them the B1 course. The next thing is the B2 course. Give them a great, you know, they're going to need the B2 course. Like, unless they stop learning English at the end of B1, they need the B2 course next. So give it to them for a great offer if they buy it now. Give them like a 30% discount, something like that, if they make a purchase now. If you don't think that they do need that course. If you think, ah, oh, you know what, that that's they're never going to get to that stage, then no, that doesn't make any sense. But if you think, you know what, they're definitely going to need that by buying it now, they're more committed, they're more likely to follow through, they're actually going to get to the end of V2 level at that stage, it's going to help improve their life, then it's like totally doing them a service by offering that to them. So if you can do it, if well, I mean, if you can do it in a way, what, what you're saying is if you can do it in a way that truly is serving them and it's not... Yeah. It's not just trying to milk them for every penny that they have, then then that does make sense. Because in your in this particular case, I don't think it makes sense to to include that what you're calling B2 course like within the within the offer they're already checking out on or even as an order bump. What you're saying is this is something if they do the if they do what they're paying for now, then they will want this afterward. And we're rewarding them with a little bit of a discount if they go ahead and buy it now versus later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and if you're not doing stuff in a way that's actually help trying to serve your audience, then you need to take a look in the mirror, right? And it's like, you've got to be doing stuff that you think is going to help them. Yeah. I know that when I've, when I've experienced funnels like that in the past myself, you know, you go through, you're thinking you're getting such a great deal. You're signing up. It's like a hundred bucks and then you hit checkout and then you immediately go to the next page and it's like, oh, but wait, like we have this even better thing and you can get it for 300 bucks. It's like, well, wait, like now, now I feel like I'm not making a truly informed decision. Like I want, I'm, and maybe I'm just like really nerdy and analytical and I want all the data up front and make the best decision. But um, when I see that upsell, I'm like, dang, should I have not bought the first thing and just gotten this thing? And then, okay, but wait, now that you've done this to me once, I know you're gonna do it to me again, so what's next, right? And so I just feel like, 
um, it can, maybe I've just had bad experiences with it. And also my particular audience skews much older. Most of my, most of my piano in 21 days audience is above like 60 years old. And so I don't think that they would, you know, they're not as tech savvy in general. And so they're, they're probably, um, uh, it would lead to some level of confusion for, for a lot of them. Um, and so with, it's not something I've ever implemented with piano in 21 days. Let me put it to you that way. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Um, I think that marketers have a tendency to ruin a lot of stuff because they can be <laughs> scummy, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the tactics are inherently bad. If mm -hmm. you go to Apple's website and you say, I want to buy an iPhone, then they're going to offer you a whole bunch of other things that can go with that iPhone, which are effectively like order bumps. And you're going to have the option to buy an extra case and you're going to have a chance to buy um, uh, what else they're going to offer you, like an iPad maybe. I'm not sure. There's a whole bunch of stuff they'll offer you when you're checking out. And after you check out, they're going to offer you Apple Care, like a you know your, your kind of insurance you get afterwards. Now you might say, "No, Apple Care is a scam as well. I don't want that either." But it's like, but the but the process of going through it, I never find feels gross. I just like, yeah, of course that makes sense. Of course, those are things I might want to get as long as it's offered to me in a way that is polite and charming and not aggressive. And you know, I've been through funnels before. Where I'm like, dude, back off! <laughs> like yeah. you're basically telling me if you don't buy this now your life will forever be terrible and you'll look back at this moment and your children's children will say, you fool, why didn't you buy that thing on that day? And instead it's like, we're trying to help people. It's like, okay, you've got that thing. That was a great choice. This is definitely going to help you to be able to improve your life in X, Y, or Z way. You're going to be able to train your dog better. You're going to be able to learn piano fast or whatever it is. The next step after that is going to be this. If you want to get help, if you want to make that commitment now and buy that thing now, then this is an opportunity and we're going to reward that by giving you a discount. Um, if you don't know, big deal, you've still made a great choice about it. It's like, I think the way that you do it is, is really important. I can get down with that. I, it makes me think of um, another, you know, marketing and sales strategy in the space, like evergreen webinars. Uh, for the longest time, you know, everybody's using these fancy pieces of software that pretend that it's live and it's, uh, you know, it's got the fake chats and everything. Um, and I don't, I don't believe in doing that. I don't believe in pretending it's live when it's not, uh, you know, some people, some people still do it, but that doesn't mean that having an evergreen webinar in and of itself is, is wrong. Maybe just that particular way of doing it is wrong. And there are more authentic ways of doing it, um, which is, you know, on-demand webinars and basically same thing, but not pretending it's, uh, pretending it's live. Do you, do you see, do you see the, like, is that a fair comparison you think? Yeah, absolutely. I know actually you found, didn't you, when you, when you changed it, I think it actually increased your conversion rate. I think you said it did. Um, it did. When you, when you changed it, I've, I've wanted to do one for a while. It's like an evergreen webinar with the fake chats, but you tell people at the beginning that it's fake. And then you <laughs> have like all the fake chats come in and go, what do you mean it's fake? But then if it's fake, you then like, but, if no, surely it's live. Cause now just say something back to this. And then you reply back to the fake chat, like as if it's live, but just kind of messing around with it. Just having fun with it, you know, but I think the reason why it kind of can help with it being, um, the evergreen webinar that auto plays at the beginning is like, it forces somebody to go watch it now, instead of saying, you can come back, watch this anytime you like. It's like, cause mm -hmm. I know you won't. It's like, but you have to watch it now. There's no other option, but let's be honest about it. And kind of, uh, um, not not pretend that it's that it's live when it's not exactly yeah the the software that i've been using lately that i really like that doesn't pretend it's live is uh e webinar have you seen that one no yeah it's 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 a newer one but it's really cool it's got some it's got some interactive features you can do polling and um it's got other interactive features but it's got it's got like a live chat that you can easily log in or someone on your team can easily log in and monitor the live chat and still interact with people, even though you're not presenting it live. Or if you're not there, it'll go to your email and you can respond later. And I've had pretty good uh, results with that. Cause I like in the presentation, I'm like, look, this is not a, this is not live, but we do have a chat that sometimes we're in there live and can interact with you. And if not, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Mm. Right. So, so it's I'm just taking the same concept and then going, well, how can we do this in an ethical way? Yeah. Like, 
part of the reason that I really like working with course creators versus, let's say, in e-commerce or in SaaS businesses is most people who are course creators who've got an audience already started teaching that thing because they really liked that topic and they really yes. liked teaching what they were teaching. And then they managed to build up an audience because they were just putting out free content and people liked it enough to follow them. So they're, they're good, ethical, nice people who have got good quality courses who want to help people. And so if that's the starting point, I can be like, okay, cool, let's add marketing onto that, but we're going to go in the right direction. Whereas some people who are just like, I just want to start a business that makes money. It's, it's kind of can get a little bit gross and it's not something that I've really enjoyed necessarily working with. You know, there's certain things that you sell, you're like, the world doesn't really need more of this. This isn't actually kind of helpful. And so a big part of our like draw, the way that we work with clients is most of our clients, their biggest fear is being salesy, scammy, spammy, like coming across in the wrong way, being too aggressive. Um, and a lot of our job is going like, you can do this stuff in a way that is okay. You can do this stuff in a way that is that you, people will still like you. You know, there's, there's your audience is still going to be happy to be working with, you know, to be following you. They're still going to, you're still going to feel good about yourself, but you also can make more money. I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with what you just said more. You know, what, what I typically find is like, um, of all the different components of, of their businesses, the course is the best component. Cause like, that's what they were good at. Like they were good at, at cooking or, or, uh, or, or birding or, or playing guitar. And so like, that's where they put most of their effort and passion into was the curriculum and making the course and, um, maybe even got better at, um, the video side of things and video editing, because that was the, that was the product. Like that was the main vehicle for people to learn. Um, but then they didn't know the first thing about funnels and traffic and email lists and and all that. So I uh, I completely agree. H how did you like? How did you get into all this? Like, did you start as a course creator yourself? No, I used to work in fitness marketing. So I'd work with charities and local government to help get inactive people from hard to reach groups into activity. So cancer patients, disabled people, over sixty fives. Um, and what I found was, so they'd all have these different classes that they were running. You know, they'd run different classes in the local gyms or at the local um, sports centers. Um, and I'd also work with like private organizations, like just, you know, a gym or a swimming pool or a yoga center who wanted to, to fill themselves up. And when I started learning about funnels and I started getting good at it, what I found was you could just fill all of these groups up really quickly and then you were kind of out of a job because you just filled it up and they didn't need anybody anymore. So I was like, oh, what can I do? What can I get into that has unlimited capacity? And so I tried out working with e-com businesses, SaaS, and online course creators. I wanted to still be online because I was like, well, I mean, two things. One, that's generally where you've got the most capacity. And two, I wanted to be able to travel the world and not worry about you know having to meet people in offices and stuff. And I just found that online course creators was the best fit. It's like it tended to be, like I said, people who are super ethical, who had uh, great products, who very often didn't know stuff about funnels and email marketing, and obviously had you know completely unlimited capacity in terms of delivery. And and what's the time frame here? How long have you been doing this? Uh, five years. Yeah, switched over in twenty eighteen. I kind of did a bit of both for a little while. I ran, I ran the previous business still for kind of a year while I was starting this one. So of the, of the three things that you mentioned, um, earlier of, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit for the people that you end up working with on the, the, the done, um, is it done for you? Is that the high level? Is it, is it done with you or done for you at the highest yeah, level? Yeah, We've got both the done. We do done for you as the high level. Yeah. And then we've okay. got a done with you service as well. So the other two items, both both are around the email list, right? I forget exactly the words you had. Said. I think it was increasing email subscribers and then increase the amount of promotions we do to the email subscribers. Was that it? Yeah. So it's Why? getting more of those email subscribers to buy, which, yes, does mean generally for most okay. people more email promotions. So the thing there with is most people do two to three email promotions a year. They do Black Friday, maybe Independence Day if they're American, maybe New Year's, something like that. And every time that they do an email promotion – they see sales spike, but they don't like doing email promotion. So they only do it when everybody else is doing it. 
Um, so what we work with people on is how can you send out email promotions every month that your subscribers love to receive? That's like super valuable, where even if they never buy anything from you, they're delighted that they're receiving these email sequences. And so we've developed this uh, nine email sequence. There's there's three lots of three. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of most of the point of most of those emails is about how do you how do you support that audience to be able to understand that problem and solve that problem themselves, and then you say and if you want more support with it we also have this course and then there's a couple at the end that are just more you know the three at the end are more standard kind of promotional ones so when you say when you say promotion we're talking about like something special that's not available year round we're discounting something we're adding a bonus something like that yeah yeah it's normally a promo it's normally a discount and sometimes a bonus and sometimes it's both of them together yeah so you so some people don't endorse uh, discounts at all. Like uh, that was some of the, the big marketing guru, uh, advice that I did, did apply early on, like 10 years ago was like, never discount your products. Um, because you want to, you don't want to like devalue them in any way. And like that I've, I've gotten off of that. Like I, 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 I love a good discount myself. Like I, I, the scare, the urgency that I use in my business is, is a discount. So it sounds like you're pro pro discount with courses, right? So there's, so Robert Cialdini did that all that that massive project, right, right in the book Persuasion, however many years, 20 years ago or something like that. And he found the six different reasons why people buy. It's authority, reciprocity, scarcity and urgency. I forget what the rest of them are off the top of my head. Um, uh, Likeability. Oh, God damn it. There's two more. Anyway, it will come to me in a minute. And depending on what you are selling and how you're selling it affects which of those you should be using. And so in the um, in the online course space, scarcity and urgency is a really big deal. That is the thing that gets somebody to go and take action now. Commitment con- and consistency uh, and social proof. There you go. That's the last two. Um, <laughs> so if you don't have a reason for people to take action now, they won't tend to get round to buying a course now that's just it's how it is it's how it works in this space so how can you do that in a way that is uh you know doesn't feel too weird to people like we tend to do a 30 percent discount so it's not like a you know this thing like so i've seen people where their courses are discounted 90 percent once a year or something like that and you're like oh man if i want that course any other time of year i feel like an idiot buying it because it's like i know that they don't really think it's worth that much Whereas at 30%, it's like, oh, okay, that's a good reason to get it now. But if I don't get it now and I get it in two months' time, I'm not going to feel like totally ripped off. It seems kind of reasonable. And then we add bonuses in as well. We find that that's that's helpful too. Um, yeah, oh, I liked it. Like if somebody offers me a discount, they're like, oh, if you buy it, you know, in the next week, we'll give you 20% off or something like that. I'm like, yeah, cool, nice. I, I, it doesn't bother me at a personal level. I don't feel bad about it. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page there. So so just to make sure I'm understanding like your recommendations and your process, like are you in addition to, you know, the promotions and promoting to the email list, like when somebody first joins an email list, are, are you, are you, are you, re- you, you recommend people have an evergreen funnel set up to capture those people and try to sell to those people? Yeah, it's actually, it's the step that I recommend people do last. Um, but we do recommend doing it. So the reason I recommend doing it last is because it uses every other tactic that we ever share with people to do. So one of the things that we teach people to do is how to write really good sales pages that are going to make it easier for someone to decide if this is right for them, to uh, feel comfortable buying, write really, make really good checkout pages that reassure people that they're buying the right product, that this is going to be a good decision, that they're going to get you know guaranteed if they don't like it, they can get their money back, all those kind of things. And we're helping people do order bumps and upsells and like improving the whole process. The funnel that you do that is uh, immediately after somebody signs up, we use a tripwire funnel as the main one that we teach people because it's the simplest to do. Evergreen webinars are amazing, but they're harder for people to get right. So we, we start people off with a, a tripwire funnel. A tripwire funnel is someone signs up to your lead magnet and the confirmation page says, you, that, that free resource you've just signed up for is going to be with you in your email inbox in the next five minutes. In the meantime, 
this is a great offer that we think is going to be really helpful for you. That's going to be like $17, $27, something like that. And then the next step is if they click through to the checkout page, you're going to have an order bump there. If they buy, then there's going to be an upsell on the next page. So that's the that's the funnel that we have at the front end. When we have taken somebody through and set up everything else, then we'll go back and we'll add on often a welcome sequence behind that that then is also then promoting a product at the end of it. And then you might have an evergreen webinar funnel after that. Um, but that's starting to get, it's starting to get more advanced. It's like, there's a lot of, there's evergreen webinars, there's a lot of parts to it to get it right. Um, whereas a tripwire funnel is quite straightforward. Okay. So my next question would be about like timing of everything. If, um, if somebody, if you, if you've got somebody that set up a, their first evergreen funnel, whatever that looks like tripwire trip, tripwire or otherwise. And then like, you know, that's, let's say that's a seven day funnel and you know, the eighth day in, in, in one opt-in person's particular case is going to be black Friday where we're doing a promotion. Like how do you, how do you adjust the timing of an evergreen funnel with actual promotions on actual days? Mm, yeah. I'll be honest. We don't, uh, do a huge amount to try and make that perfect for every subscriber. What we're mostly focused on is how do we, one of the things is there's so many different kinds of clever funnels that you can do. What happened when I, I'm going to take a step back. When I first started the business, we went through every single different marketing gurus course that we could find, you know, Russell Brunson and Ryan Dice and Jeff Walker and like every sim, um, every single different type of funnel that we could find. And we tested all of them out and we found which of them worked consistently for everybody, which of them were effective in terms of like a good sized increase in revenue and which of them was, did not take too long to do. And so based on that is how we built out our whole system. So the reason why we don't emphasize webinars is because they're harder. We're like, okay, what could you do straight away that's going to make you more money now, what could you do that's going to be effective for pretty much everybody, even if you're not great on camera, even if you're not uh, experienced in putting together a script, what have you. So as part of that, our philosophy is, how can you make it really simple to run these kind of things? So we don't have masses of automations that we teach people about. So someone goes through your welcome sequence, and then they go into an email sequence that is now, you know, maybe partway through. It's not perfect, but it's okay. You know, it's like you could exclude everybody who you know only include people in your email promotions who were available at the very start of the promotion but it's i don't know i think it's right i just don't think it matters all of that much uh we try and focus on the 80 20 as much as we can like what is it that's going to have the biggest impact and then and then kind of chill a little bit more about the rest of it yeah i think that probably works well and better for people with like more than one offer too um like with piano in 21 days we basically have just the one offer and so I would never want to do this, you know, do evergreen and, you know, somebody's get this big pitch, Hey, this is your last chance. And then the next day there's another offer. That's basically the same thing, you know? I'm, yeah. So I'm, I'm big on the user experience as well, but recognize that, you know, a lot of people have multiple offers, multiple courses or whatever. And so maybe, maybe that approach could work, but for piano in 21 days, you know, it's really important to get people in the evergreen sequence, try to sell them there. Then at the end, if they haven't bought or unsubscribed, um, that's certainly not the end, but then it's still some like for us, it's still somewhat evergreen from there because basically every, every three to four months, that same person will get repitched the offer, but it's on their timeline of the original opt-in, right? So we never, we never do big live launches to the whole list. Once you opt in, you're getting pitched every three, three to four months until you buy or unsubscribe, right? So we have people that will buy that opted in five years ago and they're on their 17th uh, you know, promotion. And that's just the way the automation works. And do you find any disadvantages with that? Do you have like any issues that come up with the automations? Does it always work super smoothly? What do you find? No, it's, it's, it's worked really, really well. You know, I think, I think you're, um, you know, you're, 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 you're a fan of deadline funnel as well. Right. So that's, that's a, that's a key piece to it working and working well. Um, it's really important to me when I tell somebody that I'm going to do something or something's going to happen that that actually happens. So, and I think that that helps with people buying the next time around. Like I'm saying, Hey, look, this is the last day you can get the $200 discount. And if they try to get the next day, they can't, then maybe they're more likely to actually take advantage next time. Cause they know I'm, I'm serious about when I say it's going away and deadline funnel is what 
I mean, the, the, the tools to execute that well for me have been active campaign and deadline funnel together. Have you had Jack on the podcast? Yes. He's phenomenal. He's, he's so humble. And he's like, yes. clearly so damn smart, <laughs> you know? So here's what I love. So for if anybody's not aware, Jack Bourne, creator of Deadline Funnel, um, he was on episode 90 something, I think. I'll have to look it up. I'll put it in the show notes. But the, he, what I love most about Jack is he created this awesome software, Deadline Funnel, which so many course creators and even other industries use. And it's, it's great. And it, it's really, really great. And he could easily just like, like sit back and be like, I've made it. Like I'm going to earn the passive income, sit on the beach. I know, I, he, I know he moved to Australia, um, but he keeps grinding and he keeps making more tools and he keeps making his existing tools better and making courses and, you know, putting out content. And he's just like, he's, he's a grinder and he's, he's got a mission. And, and I love that about Jack. Mm. Yeah. I first came across him from the, um, I was following Perry Marshall and I went through some of his courses. Yeah. Cause he worked for Perry Marshall, right? Yeah, it was his marketing manager, and he invented this model, the tactical triangle, and because he believes in threes as well, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's traffic conversion and economics, and at the center of it is eighty twenty. So the traffic, you know, you have traffic, you drive it to a website that converts, and you make a certain amount of money from it. But it's fractal as well, and it's just like it starts to get really weird and really interesting. And Perry Marshall like teaches so most of what Perry Marshall teaches now is based around that tactical triangle that Jack came up with. I don't know, ten something years ago, whatever. It's ah, uh, yeah, it's so good, so so smart. Yeah, I have I have this one guy in my coaching program that's just like because for the most part, I recommend people use Kajabi because it does a lot really well. Like you can put your course there, you can put your funnels there, you can have your maybe have your email list there. Um, even though there's some left to be desired with their, their emails, that's a, that's a separate, but like you can have your whole website there. Um, and from, you know, most people, like we're talking about, most people want to focus on what they're good at. You know, they want to focus on, you know, quilting and they're not web developers. And so if I can, if I can keep as much as possible in one place for most people, that's a really good thing as long as it works. Um, so I have this one guy in my coaching program that's like baffled that he's got to go outside of Kajabi and use deadline funnel. He's like, why? He in his mind, it doesn't seem that hard for Kajabi to be able to implement that feature, right? And I'm like, dude, I think it's a little more complicated than you're thinking. Like, it seems simple, but I think Deadline Funnel. There's a reason they've cornered the market on the evergreen deadlines because it works really well. It's not as simple as you might think, um, and I don't think it would just be like a day of programming for Kajabi to implement it into the, what they <laughs> what they do. So just go ahead and use Deadline Funnel because it's awesome. Yeah, so good. All right, so back to the email stuff. The third thing was like actually increasing your email subscribers, right? But you're not talking about doing that through additional traffic. You're saying you're saying it in a way that optimizes the traffic that's already coming in. Do I have that right? Yeah, so most people can about five to 10 times the number of new email subscribers they get per month from their website. No account. way, no way. That's way, that's way too much, John. There's no way that's true. <laughs> Five to 10 times more with so the existing virtually, traffic? Virtually everybody is at a 0.5 to 1% opt-in rate. Like I've talked to hundreds of people uh, about their numbers, and I'd say about 95% of people are in that range, 0.5 to 1%. And most- oh, so, so clarify what that is. That's like just a, a, a new, unique visitor anywhere on the site ending up on your email list, right? Okay. Yes, yeah. So in a given day, if I get 100 people new on my website, any page, blog, homepage, wherever- then 1% would be one person opting in. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Got yeah. it. And virtually everybody can get to 3%. And the best we've ever had is 9.3%. I would say not many people can get there, but most people could get to five if they really, really worked at this. Virtually everybody can get to three. Like I don't think we've had anybody who didn't get to three. So if you go from 0 0.5 to 3%, that's six times... The opt-in rate, if you can get to 5%, then that's 10 times. If it's from 1% to 3%, then it's only like, you know, three times increase. But that's the kind of range we're looking at normally. So there's just a few very basic, simple things that most people aren't doing. So the first one is most people have got double opt-in turned on. So what I'd recommend to everybody is turn double opt-in off. The reason that you that there's going to be nuance to this, but the reason that most of the email service providers have double opt-in 
is so that you don't have dodgy emails on your email list that aren't actually like an actual email address that isn't going to go through because then it affects deliverability for you and for everybody else on the same server, it's a bit of a pain. But there are much better ways of increasing your uh, deliverability than just having a double opt-in. There's loads and loads of people um, who are good email subscribers who want to be on your email list who won't see that one particular email and click it that gets them to opt in um, to your email list on that double opt-in. So let's just clarify real quick, just to be abundantly clear, double opt-in meaning the first email I get is, hey, please confirm you actually want to receive emails from this person. Click this one more time in an email, and then you can start getting emails. That's the double nature. Single opt-in is if I opt in for something, then I'm then I'm getting the emails, right? Exactly, exactly yeah. right, yeah. And so that one email sucks. And it's like, instead of that, what you can do is say, right, you're going to assume somebody wants to be on your email list, but after 10 emails or a month or whatever it is, if they haven't aren't opened anything, then you take them off the list, then you remove them or you send a re-engagement campaign or whatever. And so what that means is people have got a bunch of chances to set, to show that they're actually interested in getting your emails and that they that they've put in the right email address and rather than just that one chance. And so it, most people, it doubles the number of leads you're getting per month. Obviously, not all of those are good. Some of them are, you're going to get rid of again. But when we tested it in terms of revenue with a client, it went up by 20% just from increasing, just from turning double opt-in off. So that's the first thing. Second one is show whatever lead magnet you've currently got more often on your site. So most people have got it in a couple of places. They might have it on the homepage. They might have a pop-up. They might have it in the sidebar. Just put it in all of the places. This is like the main thing you've got the website for is to get traffic. You then might get onto your email list. This is where people buy from. Like mm -hmm. email is is the thing that is that drives sales in in course businesses. So have it on your homepage. Have it as a pop up. Put it in the sidebar and also put it in line within blog posts. So let's say you've got a three thousand word blog post. Have it top, middle, and bottom of that post. And so if you look at um, one of our clients, tealswan.com, uh, uh, and you go onto their website, you'll, you can see examples of what this actually looks like in person. If you click on Teal's work and then articles, then you'll see it. all of the articles on there as you scroll through it. You'll see it's in the sidebar, it's at the top, it's in the middle, it's at the bottom. And it's basically what we've done is made an advert for the lead magnet. So the lead magnet is five free meditations. We've made a bunch of different graphics that are going to catch different people's attention because it's got a different headline promoting it. It's got different benefits. It's got different images in there. So as they're scrolling through, they'll see it. If they click on it, it brings up the pop-up. That seems to convert slightly better than sending them to a separate page to have the pop-up. And then they put their email address in there. Um, and that's that's the basics of it for having it on your site. And that's we found when we did it with Teal Swan, they went from 100 opt-ins a week to 800 opt-ins a week just by changing that there's that that there's the eight times okay i mean it sounds like you've got data to show that that five to ten is is possible um and by the way you know this, this is a primarily audio um format so teal swan that's t-e-a-l like if somebody wants to visit the it's t-e-a-l s-w-a-n.com yeah. and see that see that example okay very cool so basically every page uh, on your site should have at least one place to opt in and, and blog posts more than one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the only place that you don't want that pop-up showing is on your sales pages or the checkout pages. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it because I have seen it. <laughs> it's like, no, don't distract them. Let them. Well, one thing that I've done, um, John, about a year, about maybe 18 months ago, um, I switched my urgency tactic from the availability, meaning you've got to be within the funnel to even have the opportunity to buy and outside of the funnel, you you just literally can't buy to a discount. And so when I did that, I had to add in a sales page to my website, which I never had before um, at the full price. And on that sales page, I do have uh, an opt-in because I basically included in my pricing table, like, hey, here you can get, you know, the, for me, it's, you know, I mentioned the bottom package and the top package, but in my, in that sales page, I have, you know, three, uh, elements on my pricing table. And the bottom one is like, try it for free. And it's my opt-in. Yeah. yeah. So that would be, that would be probably the only exception that I would say is, is, as having an opt-in on a sales page. 
And maybe you rec- maybe that's not a good idea, but but that people do opt in there because I don't necessarily want them to buy at the full price. Like I want them to get in my funnel, and that's that's really that's where the urgency happens. That's where the the conversion rate is super high. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the huge, huge majority of sales, if you're doing it uh, properly, come from the people on the email list. So there's not that much loss by having you know you're not there's not that. If you're currently getting most of your sales from people buying directly on your website, it means you're missing out on about 80% of the sales that you could be getting. Yeah, if not more, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so of all the, um, all traffic is not created equal, right? So if we want people to come to our site and then and then opt in, like let's, let's say that's, you know, the first goal, um, throw out even selling to them. Like, have you noticed that certain traffic sources um, will end up at a higher like opt-in rate than others? Well, if someone's coming from, let's say your Instagram, then the opt-in rate is astronomically high because what's happened there is someone's had to leave Instagram to get to your website to come and opt-in. So that's the, so on the website, we mostly have the opt-in just be a pop-up, but we also do have an opt-in page, a regular lead magnet opt-in page. And if we're pointing somebody from Instagram, we'll point directly to that page or from Facebook or YouTube or whatever else, right? And the opt-in rates there are about 70%. Whereas if someone, if you just had an opt-in page on your site and we're pointing traffic from within the site, you get it about 40 to 50. And if you had, if you have uh, cold ads pointing to your opt-in form, you're looking at like, I don't know, 20, 25%, something yeah. in that kind of ballpark. What I've noticed is, um, is SEO traffic is actually one of the lowest. Um, mm. And it, it, there's a lot of factors there, but what I've seen, what I, what I feel the reason is, is cause there's very, there's very specific intent with SEO traffic. Like they were searching for something that maybe is unrelated to whatever your opt-in is, right? In some cases, completely unrelated, but I've noticed, um, you know, I have some people I've worked with where their only traffic source is SEO and they get a ton of traffic, like a ton of traffic, but then just a handful of opt-ins. And it's like, why, why can't we get these people to opt in? We're, you know, we're doing what John says. Like we have these these uh, uh, opportunities to opt in everywhere on the blog post, everything. And I think that at, at some point, it's just like, um, you've got to look at the quality of the traffic and, and what their intent is. So when you say SEO traffic, do you mean as opposed to direct or from referrals? Or do you mean as opposed to you've got a YouTube channel or an Instagram channel or something like that? No, I'm talking about like Google search, right? Yeah, but Google search versus versus what? What what do you see as the better? Traffic? Oh yeah, yeah. So like uh, through some sort of content marketing channel, right? So yeah, exactly what you're saying. Like th- they watched the YouTube video first, or they watched Instagram, or they're already subscribed, and they finally moved over to our website. Um, uh, mostly content marketing channels, or 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 from well, I guess if it's coming from an email list, we don't need them to opt in. But yeah, compare and even ads too, like. Um, if we run an ad and we're saying, hey, go download our free workbook or go attend our webinar, like there's, and if they click on it and go to our site, there's intent there. Like it's it's congruent. It's like, okay, I, I see this workbook. I want it. I'm going to click on it. And there's more information about the workbook. Whereas if I'm teaching, if I have a course about, you know, uh, surviving in the wilderness and somebody Googles, is Googling like how to make a knife and they find an article I wrote, well, that doesn't mean that they, they're in the market for a course on, um, or, or even a, a workbook on, you know, eight tips to survive in the wilderness. Maybe all I wanted to learn about was knives. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the interesting thing with that, I think is, it's true if you look at the point of opt-in, but like with SEO traffic, what we're seeing, like I said, is like that kind of about 3% is a, is a re- realistic number to get to. If you're looking at YouTube channel, if you compare views on your YouTube channel to number of opt-ins that you can get, you're looking at about a 1% opt-in rate. So of those who make it from the YouTube channel to your website to the opt-in, yeah, 100%, they're like really likely by that point to opt-in, but it's quite hard to get them over. And actually getting to 1% involves quite a lot of like, um, one of the things that's a real, uh, drives me crazy with YouTube videos is once you've made the video and you've got it up there, you can't go back and add in to the video to promote your lead magnet. Like you could change your blog post really easily, right? Yeah. On the YouTube video, you can add in, um, oh God, my brain's gone, uh, but like a little a little pop-up on the video at the end. You can add the cards. Exists. You can add cards, cards and screens. Yeah, right. Yeah, and you can have the description link off to the lead magnet, 
But the ideal is you promote the lead magnet in the video itself. So there's a friend of mine, Ben Dozwolski, who runs a uh, wad prep. So it's um, a workout of the day. What's that? CrossFit. And so in every video that he's got, he'll promote one of his lead magnets. He'll be like, today we're going to be doing a video about like how to do more pull-ups. If you want the ultimate guide to doing the maximum number of pull-ups, you can download that from wadprep.com slash pull-ups, whatever. That gets him a lot more opt-ins than if he just had the card at the end or he just had the uh, you know link in the description. But you've got to do that from the beginning. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I guess from starting right now, you know? Yes. Yes. That is one thing that I did from the very beginning 10 years ago is, is at the end of every video, I, Hey, if you want to learn more, go down my workbook, but it does lock you into that, that opt-in too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the only thing that's changed is I've changed, like, originally it was, it was like the first five, uh, sorry, first eight days of my workbook, in, uh, of my course in a free workbook. And, uh, over the years, it changed to the first five days because I was giving away too much for free. Um, so those first view, a few videos still say, hey, go go grab my workbook of the first eight days and they click on it and then it's the first five days. Um, but like if I ever like if I ever wanted to change my main opt in or like um, or that just like wasn't working anymore, or maybe that maybe somebody's got an opt in that's simply not relevant anymore. Right. Um, then that's the only like negative to like actually saying it in the video. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I don't know the way around that apart from make it generic, but then you don't want it yeah. to be generic. You want it to be specific. So I don't know. But it's like, I think overall, you're better off mentioning it. And like, if you ever, ever, ever change your lead magnet page, make sure the old one redirects. Fair. Like if your video, if yes. your YouTube video is pointing somewhere, and then because I saw someone do this not long ago, it's like, oh, what happened to all our options? It's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, you yeah. have to set up a redirect either redirect or update the update the links in YouTube. Right. Um, all right. What I've found is that, um, a lot of course creators struggle more in the traffic department, right? They actually have decent funnels and courses and offers and, um, you know, make some sales, but if they could just increase the traffic, you know, if they can double their traffic, maybe their business doubles, if they can five X their traffic, maybe their business five X's right. Um, do you have any advice on traffic or is that just like completely out of your lane? So here's what we do. The way we look at it is once you are making, as your funnels are really damn good and you're making as much money as possible from every visitor who comes to your site, you can afford to buy traffic because if every visitor is worth twice as much to you, then it's much easier to be able to, to afford to just spend money on ads to get people along to your website. So the approach that we take is we go through the whole process. We increase the average order value. We increase the number of email promotions. We make sure they're really optimized. We uh, increase the opt-ins and we set up a front-end funnel and we optimize everything in there. And then once we've got that working, then we start to look at how do we drive more traffic through ads. So um, we'll typically, we've got some like specific benchmark numbers we're looking to hit with that front-end funnel. How much of the traffic is converting? What's the average order value, et cetera? Um, and then we'll start to run ads into the lead magnet to start with. And then once, if we're getting it that you're driving traffic with the lead magnet from ads, those people are opting in and then a percentage of them are buying, we'll then start to test out ads directly into the tripwire funnel. So going straight to the sales page, because even though the conversion rate will be a bit lower and you don't get the leads, you do get, uh, you haven't lost those 60% of people who didn't opt in, who, you know, with a lead magnet, who then weren't seeing that sales page at all. So I'll point people straight in there. If we can get that working, then you can kind of start to scale up in that way. The other thing I think that's a really big deal is if you're making a bunch more money from what you're currently doing, you know, you've already got a certain amount of traffic, then you make more money from that traffic, reinvest some of that money back into making more content or better quality content. So you're currently doing SEO, let's say and you're doing two posts a week, well, now you're making a bunch more money, take some of that money, put it back in and now do four posts a week or do better YouTube videos or whatever else it is, you know? So that's the kind of approach we take with it. How about you? How do you, how do you approach that one? My favorite form of, um, of traffic generation and audience building is content marketing. I think it's, um, it's one that depending on the platform can, um, give you a lot of bang for the buck in terms of, you know, you make a video or a other type of piece of content and it, it can last a long time. You know, I've got one video I made five years ago that makes me like five figures in sales every month. 
Uh, now it was a hit, you know, it's got millions of views on YouTube. Um, but I would have never been able to make that video if I hadn't made the, you know, 45 before it probably, <laughs> right. That were, that were kind of duds. Um, but I'm a big fan of content marketing and I think it also is offers a lot of value to people too, even, even people that don't buy or, or don't buy right now. Um, but then there's also, um, another form of, of like audience building and traffic generation that I like to do, um, as well that I think is underutilized is, um, and I think you'll appreciate this given the, the medium we're talking about right now, but like getting on other people's podcasts, you know, and, and getting in front of other people's audiences that way you have a podcast, I have a podcast. I don't know about you, but when people like pitch me to come on my podcast, it's awful. Like they, people do not know how to, how to pitch to come on an, on a, somebody else's podcast. Like maybe 1% are, are halfway decent, but they're either, they're either not from the person they're from some agency they've hired to try to get them on shows, or they're just like, um, very generic. Right. And like, if you're going to pitch me to come on my podcast, I need to know exactly like what value you're going to provide to my audience and that that's relevant to this audience, right? Don't, don't come on and just be like, Hey, I'm an expert in, uh, you know, sales pages. Um, you know, love to come on the podcast. Well, I need to know why that's like, can you help course creators with sales pages? Like, are you selling like dog treats, you know? Um, and so I, I think, you know, that's another, that's another traffic generation strategy that I recommend. Yeah. And we take, so I go on quite a lot of podcasts and I take it really seriously in the approach we take. We look to agencies and a general response I had from everybody I talked to about working with them was that it was just awful. <laughs> like link building agencies, you know, all those emails you get like, oh, can we have a link on your website? It's like, no, just go away. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go through and listen to like two or three episodes of that person's podcast. We'll go through, like find relevant topics that they've they've had on before. We'll be like, oh, I think we can have an interesting angle on this thing that you previously covered Here's what I think that we could cover about it. And I'll often do podcast swaps as well. Like we'll say to somebody, you know, do you want to come on our podcast and talk about, I think you'd be really good to talk about this. And I can come on your podcast and talk about that. Yeah. Um, and I just feel a lot better about trying to do it in a way that like, if I received that email, I wouldn't think, oh dear God, you know? <laughs> yeah. And look, like I can only imagine the people that got to have the really big podcast, how many, how many emails they get. Yeah. Cause you know, I get probably one a day and my, you know, my podcast isn't, isn't giant. Um, and it's just like, I'm just constantly blown away by how, how poor the, the pitches are. And so I think it's low hanging fruit because the bar is so low. Yeah. I have somebody who manages my email, so I never see those. Good for you. All right, John. Well, this is uh man, this has been a pleasure. Um, Let's talk about like where people can find more about you and your stuff. Like you, let's, let's start with the podcast. Uh, what, what's the name of the podcast? Podcast is the art of selling online courses. How'd you come up with that name? Online course show was already taken. <laughs> <laughs> My copywriter told me that's what we're going to call it. She's very pleased. No, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, what, what's the, what's, what's your, um, What's your pitch for your podcast? Like how, uh, you know, why, why should listeners of this one listen to yours? Yeah. So we do about half of the episodes is me interviewing my team, my delivery team on what have oh. they done recently to actually increase uh, conversions or increase revenue for one of our clients. And we try and get really super specific on, okay, here's exactly the way that we wrote these emails or here's the elements of a sales page, what have you. Um, and then the other half is interviewing people who are, Suppose you know, there's, there's two other two other types. One is people who run course businesses themselves, so it's case studies, and then the other kind is people who drive traffic for online course businesses. Because we don't primarily focus on traffic, so like, okay, let's interview people who are really good at YouTube videos, or really good at YouTube ads, or Facebook ads, or all this kind of thing. So um, those are the elements that we're not really covering. So we want to try and uh, help our audience in that way. Very cool, and then your your website and is there any specific place on your website that you'd want to point people yeah so the website is datadrivenmarketing.co and that's just going to allow you to go see everything that we're up to if you want to get the um if you want us to do a review of your funnel you can go to pimpyourfunnel.com 
and uh we would put in your numbers to put in like your name and your email and like your website traffic and that kind of thing we'll figure out for you of the tactics i've mentioned today and there's like i didn't mention everything today but like of the tactics we work with on our, with our clients on which of them are most likely to work for you which ones should you do first and how much revenue is it going to make you um and then about for about five people a month we'll do a video funnel review as well so we just only have kind of limited time so we can't do it for everybody but um, if you fill it out, then there's a good chance that you'll, we'll do that for you. So that's basically someone from my team will go through and review your homepage, your courses page, your sales page, and your checkout page, and tell you this specifically is exactly what you need to change. So then you can just go through and make those changes yourself and, and make a bunch more money. I thought everybody was getting videos, man. I, I went through that. I went that to that link a couple of weeks ago and I, I was like, I got a 15 minute personalized video from somebody on your team. And I was like, holy smokes, like this is a, this is a killer funnel. Like that very personalized. Yeah. We'd love to do it for everybody. We'll do it. We do it for anybody who's got a big course business and we'll do it for some other people as well who were just like, how can we help out more? But they are that. Yeah. My team do a lot of work on those, on those videos and uh, they're pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, we, when we charge for them, we charge a thousand bucks, but we try and do, a, you know, try and do as many as we can free for people. Um, as well. That's at pimpyourfunnel.com. Amazing. I, I owe you some money, it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> you're good, you're all right. Look, I, there was one question I meant to ask you earlier that I would love to, to drop yeah. for you before we get out of here, but you mentioned um, that, like like benchmark numbers, you mentioned with um, you know traffic coming in, you feel like everybody could get to like at least 3% on, on um, you know traffic into opt-in, um, into actually opting in. Are there some other benchmark numbers like that that you feel like are um, like targets for people in terms of okay maybe you know landing page opt in rate or you know total fu funnel conversion rate or something like that? Yeah, so if you're doing email promotions every month, you can expect to get about 0.3 percent of people from your email list to buy each month. That's assuming you're selling kind of lower ticket stuff like hundred, two hundred, seventy nine dollar, that kind of thing. So let's say you've got 100,000 people on your email list. Then you're looking at, what would that be? 300 people buying? 100,000 times 0.3%. 300 people buying each time that you do a promotion. Um, on a tripwire funnel, you're looking at about a 3% conversion rate from new subscribers to sale with um, order bumps and upsells order bumps is about 30 to 60 percent conversion rate and uh upsells is about once you've really optimized it you can get to about 15 to 20 percent we've had higher ones we had one recently at 28 percent, but normal is kind of 10 to 20 15 to 20 that kind of thing um what else checkout pages typically if you can get your checkout page to convert at about 20 percent, you're pretty good We've got some with clients converting at about 50%. So that's of people who get as far as the checkout page. They've gone to the sales page. They get to the checkout page for them to actually buy. About 20% is um, is pretty strong there. Um, and I'm just trying to think the number conversion rate from sales page to checkout page. I think it's about <laughs> I think it's about 20%, but I should I shouldn't really say when I'm not completely sure. Yeah. All good. No, those are some good numbers. I think people are always wondering if, even if they are, tr you know, a lot of people aren't even tracking their numbers. And when they are, it's like, okay, I'm tracking this. Is this any good, right? Is Should I work on making this better or is it already as optimized as it could be? So having some benchmarks is always a good thing. I found, I've got, I pulled up the spreadsheet where we, we track all of these things. The average conversion rate from sales page to checkout page, 23.4%. So yeah, it's about right. Very nice. John, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate you sharing all this with us. Cool. Yeah, of course. Thanks very much for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Let's do it again. Take care. Catch you later. Another episode in the books. Thank you so much out there for listening. You're you're on your commute. You're you're walking your dog. You're on a run. You're at the gym. You're you're listening at night before going to bed. I cannot thank you enough for being out there and listening and and supporting this podcast. Just simply. 
Thank you. And thank you to John for joining me here today. Remember, his website is datadrivenmarketing.co. He's also got a podcast about online courses. So you check out his podcast if you just can't get enough online course podcast content. His podcast is called The Art of Selling Online Courses. I've been on his podcast a couple of times now. So, hey, you maybe you could start on one of the episodes I've been on, but he's got a ton of episodes over there as well. Remember the free workshop I told you about, the free training, it's called the Online Course Business Formula. If you want to learn about all the things that successful six and seven figure course creators are doing that you probably are not doing yet, or maybe there's one little thing here that's just like the, the missing piece for you to make it all come together and work, that's what you're gonna learn in that free training. Just head to theonlinecourseguy.com and click on free workshop there at the top. For all links and show notes that we've talked about here today, you can find that at oc.show slash 199. And next episode is that magic 200. So I told you at the beginning, I would tell you who the guest is for episode 200. And it's with one of my all time favorite people. See back 10, 11, 12 years ago, I was really trying to make some kind of online business work. Ever since reading the four hour work week, which was, that was about 15 years ago. No, the guest next week is not Tim Ferriss. Maybe he'll be episode 300. But ever since reading 4-Hour Workweek, that's what really made me want to create some kind of freedom business, some kind of online business that that allowed me to live anywhere, do anything, you know, make more money than I was making as an engineer. And look, I had a lot of failures. Uh, I tried a lot of different things. I tried a couple of blogs. I tried to make an app. It wasn't until I found an online course, an online course business around something that I, I knew I could teach other people that I really found success. And one of the people in one of the podcasts that really influenced my journey there and, and helped make Piano in 21 Days as successful as it's been is the Smart Passive Income podcast by Pat Flynn. And that's exactly who the guest is on next week's episode. So Pat has a really interesting uh, take on courses. He didn't start on courses until maybe six or seven years ago, well after he had started his business because he was afraid about how it would look. He, he, he gave a lot of information away for free. He didn't want to feel like he was duping or scamming people, uh, but he got some advice from a friend of his that said, hey, look, courses can actually help serve your audience on an even deeper level. And so he's been doing courses ever since. And recently he rolled out a new model for his courses. He's got this all access pass and he calls them community centered courses. And so he's got this just whole new take on courses. And that I thought was a, a great opportunity to really geek on on courses with Pat Flynn. And so you'll hear us talk a lot about that in the next episode and just his, his progression and his story with courses. This conversation I'll share with you with Pat Flynn is over an hour long. And I only got to maybe half the things that I wanted to ask him. So it was a it was a phenomenal conversation, super super uh, value packed. Uh, it's an episode you definitely definitely won't want to miss. So that's coming up in the very next episode, episode two hundred. So this has been episode one ninety nine. Hope to see you next time for that special episode two hundred. I'll see you then.